All right, the kids can head on out for, uh, for their little uh, service in the hut. You can head out on in that direction. Uh, the rest of us, if, uh, if you just have a bulletin, just want to draw your attention to a couple of things since we are starting this year. Um, so we uh, didn't have men's theology this last week for reasons of illness. Uh, so we will have it two weeks from now, but this week is the uh, ladies' study. Uh, you'll see the details there in the bulletin, and uh, if you kind of want to know what is kind of going on and you like colorful pictures, you can pick up this insert in the back. Uh, it tells you about adult Sunday school, men's theology, and the women's study, uh, which starts this Tuesday. Uh, men's uh, shooting night, Skeets and Meats, this Saturday. You'll have details right there and an address uh, if you're not sure where that is, uh, you can contact me or somebody else who's been there. It's basically just a little ways down there, and then a little ways down there, and then a little ways that way. So, yeah, or you can Google it, probably a better idea. So, yeah, mine are not exact uh, directions. So, again, bring your meat, bring your lawn chairs. Uh, if you have your own firearm, you can bring one. If not, one will be provided for you, uh, along with a lot of clay pigeons and a lot of shells. So um, please come and enjoy us for that time. Uh, the other thing I want to draw your attention to, just really quickly, uh, on the back of the bulletin, kind of every three or four months or whatever, um, I post some recommended reading for you, uh, typically as it relates to the sermon series that we're going through uh, as well as a couple of other things. Um, so there's a, a few good resources there on uh, Christology, a couple of really uh, a good one there by Sinclair Ferguson, sort of on sanctification, on uh, Christ-centered ways of living. Uh, then a, uh, a really short book written for kind of grade 12 students, first-year Bible college students uh, on uh, apologetics, uh, sort of a, a brief uh, way in which you can sort of change your thinking about um, about your faith and how to defend it, how to witness. Uh, and then I usually put in, and this is the case here, uh, kind of one or two books that are not Christian books written by secular authors uh, that help us think. Uh, so not, uh, and so this one by David McRaney is uh, th one of the greatest titles, You Are Now Less Dumb. Uh, his first title in, the, in that series is You're Not So Smart. Uh, and this one, it's basically on logical fallacies uh, and helping us to sort of change the way we think. So if you have any questions about those books, uh, which ones you should read, which ones you shouldn't, uh, you can contact me. So please turn to the book of Hebrews. Once again, we will read the first uh, four verses of chapter 1. Uh, we will look specifically at, this, at uh, the second half of verse 2 and then verse 3. But we'll read the first uh, four verses just to make sure we grab our context. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the, power of his wor by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs." Let's commit our time in this passage to the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention uh, to these verses and the, just the wealth and of information here, the beauty of the Jesus that they reveal, I pray that you would help us to understand what the author is communicating, to understand it so that it can become part of the foundation upon which our faith rests. And Lord, as we begin to or continue to come to a deeper understanding of who you are, I pray that that would transform us, that you would use these seven truths in this short little text 
to mold us and shape us into the image of whom they are written about. For your glory, amen. It's hard for us to understand how a truly remarkable it would have been for the first generations of Christians to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, by the first generation, I'm not talking about people who would have been around when Jesus is around, who would have known somebody who knew him or something like that. I'm talking about uh, the first generation after the death of Christ, the, the time of the apostles. So if the book of Hebrews was written kind of mid to late 60s, we're talking about a, a group of people who converted to Christianity not because of any sort of witness directly of who Jesus was, but based upon having the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. And we can imagine the remarkable nature given the fact that it was so new. Right, this Jesus guy only died 15, 20, 30 years ago, and now he's being spoken of as someone that you need to have faith in. You need to abandon your Roman and Greek religion and philosophy. You need to abandon your ancient Jewish faith. And since Hebrews is written to a congregation of Jewish Christians, uh, you can just imagine how difficult it would be for them to leave something so ancient for something so new. And you can just imagine the arguments, uh, whether they be purposeful and reasoned or whether they just be sort of off the cuff at a family gathering, that, that their friends and relatives and neighbors would have argued with them concerning their decision. You're going to become a Christian? Well, Jesus was just a guy, right? We read in the Gospels, is that not the guy just from over there, the carpenter from Nazareth, right? He, he died on a cross. Don't, don't you know your Old Testament scriptures? Don't you know that it is a despicable thing, an unspeakably wicked thing to be hung upon a cross. It, in fact, even in our culture, in Roman culture, it's saved for the worst of criminals. And now you're claiming that you need to have faith in this guy? Listen, we know that Jesus was just a, another zealot in a long list of zealots that were trying to throw the Roman overlords out of Jerusalem, and, and, and they did so in the name of Yahweh, claiming all sorts of authority and all sorts of power, and then the Romans got him, killed him, and that was the end of it. And you know what? Listen, I'll give you this. I'll give you the fact that he, he was a good guy. He, may, maybe he will be seen in, in years in the future as a, as a prophet of God. Maybe he was even, even on the line of, you know, your Isaiahs and your Jeremiah's and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's, he was a good teacher. He had really, really good things to say. He did a lot of really, really good stuff. And you can just hear the Jewish leaders, the Jewish opposition in the years following Jesus' death uh, by telling them that the real problem doesn't lie with, with Jesus. The, the real problem actually is in these, fan, this, these fantastical disciples, right? These, uh, these guys come along and they're making these outlandish claims about this carpenter. And who were these guys? They were fishermen. They were tax collectors, the worst of the worst. These guys were nobodies, and, and yet they realized that, oh, we've committed our life to, to this guy, and now he's gone, so what we need to do is create a religion around him. And so this Jesus of Nazareth, this, this zealot that was killed by the Romans, this, this guy from Nazareth, has been converted into somebody that is actually now being worshipped, and now you, a Jew with the Old Testament who should know better, is willing to give it all up to follow Jesus? You can just imagine the kind of pressure that some, most, maybe all of these Jewish converts were feeling. 
And you can feel that, that at least some of them, I, I know if it was me, I would feel a tremendous amount of pressure to revert back to an ancient faith rather to an embrace a newfound faith. And it's for this reason that the epistle of Hebrews was written. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing for us. We, we don't feel those kinds of pressures that, that these Jewish believers would have felt. But I, I think all of us can recognize the arguments that I've just hypothetically offered as arguments that you might engage as people try and convince you to turn from your faith. The arguments from the first century against who Jesus was haven't changed all that much in 2,000 years. All you got to do is pull up a lecture from uh, the late Christopher Hitchens or, or Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris or some of these other atheistic philosophers, and you're going to hear exactly the same kinds of things that I just articulated to you that were around in the first century. Faith in Jesus comes at a price. It came at a price for the first century Jewish Christians, and it comes at a price for us. And so the author of Hebrews, as part of his purpose in writing this book, seeks to demonstrate that Jesus is worth all the trouble that you're going to encounter by following him. When you commit to following Jesus, you are going to set yourself up for persecution and opposition. Now, uh, just one of the things I think we need to notice, especially as a theologian, is, is that when, when, you, when you talk to people about why Jesus, what do they typically do? Oh, you know what? I was struggling with depression and, uh, and Jesus came in and, and now I'm not depressed anymore. Or, you know, my marriage sucked and Jesus and now it's awesome. And it's always practical, right? It's always practical. Same thing you get from somebody who joins AA, right? I was depressed and I went to AA and they convinced me not to drink alcohol anymore and I'm not depressed anymore. Right? My marriage was in shambles because of alcohol, and I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and they convinced me that, you know, to do these kinds of things, and now I don't drink anymore, and my marriage is back. Right? No, well, what does our author do? You're questioning your faith. You want to know why Jesus is so important? Let me give you some of the deepest theology your mind could ever consider. He doesn't even say, hey, Hebrews, how's it going? I'm writing to you from such and such. I love you guys. God's blessing to you. I pray for you. The typical Pauline stuff, he says, no, 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 no. God spoke through our forefathers. He's the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Why Jesus? This is why. What makes Jesus worth believing in? What makes Jesus worth committing your life to? What makes Jesus worth following as he says with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. What makes Jesus worth submitting yourself to ridicule and insult and possibly even persecution? In short, we could say it like this. What makes Jesus so special? What's the big deal? Make no mistake about the importance of that question. What's the big deal about Jesus? It's not about what Jesus can do for you. It's about who he is and what he has done. We're not talking uh, about a, a decision on the level of so many other decisions that we make. right? It's, it's not on the same level as, as you know, what kind of, are you going to choose, are you going to cheer for the Jets or are you going to cheer for God's team, the Montreal Canadiens? I know you're not considering the Leafs. It's not even on the same level as who you're going to marry. What kind of work are you going to do? It's not on the level of, of uh, you know, who's your favorite podcaster? Who's your favorite preacher? It's not even on the level of, you know, which political candidate are you going to vote for in the upcoming ele elections? Or which school board representative do you want on the school board? Uh, it, Every decision that we make pales in comparison to what we're going to do with Jesus. Because the question of who Jesus really is, what makes him so special, and what we're going to do with him, 
See, on our response hangs heaven and hell, hangs eternity. Now, this sermon series is titled The Supremacy of Christ in All Things. And last week, we sort of, I suggested to you that we could put it in sort of layman's terms in the vernacular as Jesus is better. Jesus is better. It's the overall theme of the book. Jesus is better than everything that preceded him in the Old Testament. What Jesus offers humanity is better than anything anyone else can offer and is better than anyone else could possibly imagine. And this passage that we're dealing with today, these, these short two and a half verses or so, or verse and a half actually, just drives home the reason why Jesus is better. Explaining to us why Jesus indeed is special. Telling the original authors of Hebrews why Jesus is worth leaving thousands of years of Old Testament tradition for. And it tells us why it's worth the ridicule, the persecution, the trouble that believing him may cause us. This passage today offers us seven necessary truths about Jesus. These are, these are foundational things. These are things upon which you stand. These are not things that you read and go, okay, well, this th obviously, that makes a one-to-one -one correspondence with what I'm going on, with what's going on in my life, right? Oh, I'm struggling, I'm battling. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Well, that doesn't have any practical benefit. Well, not if you're thinking so shallow, but it changes everything, everything, if you truly believe in it. See, the author's goal is to make his readers, make the original auth uh, uh, audience and us supremely confident about who Jesus is. So that instead of doubting, instead of trembling, Instead of withdrawing in the face of opposition, what we will stand firm. And not just stand firm, but that we will also have the confidence to proclaim his supremacy and his glorious gospel to a fallen world in the face of opposition. That's where our author is taking us as he reveals these seven necessary truths. You'll find them in the, in the bulletin. This is a, a very easily outlined text there are seven things that our author is talking about. Really, uh, in these first four verses, there are nine things that he's going to say about Jesus. We talked about one of them last week, the fact that he is the revelation of God, the final, ultimate, complete revelation of God. The next one we're going to read about next week, his superiority and supremacy. And this week, we're going to talk about the seven necessary truths regarding who Jesus was and what he did. And there's some pretty spectacular theology here. And we're going to try and go relatively quickly so that we don't get too bogged down. Uh, and I was sort of thinking yesterday, as I was reflecting on this, each one of these phrases is worth at least one lengthy sermon on. So you're welcome for not doing that. Or, I'm sorry that I didn't do that. Whichever, whichever one you are. Depends how good a Christian... No, I'm just kidding. So let's begin where the second half of verse 2 begins. Jesus is the heir of all things. Now this is a natural sort of transition, a natural movement for our author to go in. Because he's already talked about the fact that God has spoken now, finally, ultimately... In his son. So the, the text, the author moves naturally from sonship to heirship, if that's even a word. And so one of the things that we notice about our author, uh, one of the things we always have to remember about our author is he's got the Old Testament in the back of his mind all the time. And I think one of the passages that we have, uh, or that the author has in the back of his mind, is that famous messianic psalm, Psalm 2, where the language there speaks very, very much 
like it does in this verse. Now we know, I, I think we know that Psalm 2 is on the author's mind because in verse 5, just a few verses down, he's going to quote directly from Psalm 2. So Psalm 2 verse 7 is quoted in Hebrews 1 verse 5. So I think, I think we already have this sort of understanding that Psalm 2 is in the back of his mind. Well, why is that significant? Well, when he says that Jesus is the heir of all things, that he is the son who is God's final revelation, what he is talking about or the language he's using is, is to identify God. God, or to identify Jesus with God's anointed and his son from Psalm chapter 2. So Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. So Jesus is, is talked about here as though the Father has come back and said, All right, you have asked me. To make the nations your heritage. You have asked me to make the ends of the earth and its peoples your possession. So now I am going to make you the heir. Jesus is what Psalm 2 is focused about, focused on, what Psalm 2 is talking about. And so Psalm 2 sets the feet of this particular phrase. Jesus has been appointed by God as the heir of everything. It has been God's purpose from eternity past that the Son should inherit all things. Now we know that that this language of inheritance is problematic when it comes to God if we sort of go one to one because we know about inheritance, right? What happens with inheritance? Well, the person who is giving the inheritance has to die before the person receiving the inheritance can actually get what their heirship says that they should get. But we know that the father will not die, right? He's, he's divine. He has no beginning, no end. Uh, but the, the mentality that we're supposed to get is related to our understanding of inheritance. But Jesus is appointed to be heir. And since he is appointed to be heir of what God can give him, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus must then also be God. Simply because we know that all things exist for God's glory. So for God to create and then to purposefully move things along and then to make Jesus the heir tells us that the Father and the Son are co-equally divine. The Father can have no other heir than that which is equal to him in divinity. So to inherit all things, you must also be able to to do all things for the glory of God. God would not hand his inheritance of all things over to somebody who's going to screw it up. And Jesus won't do that. Now, the word appointed here is actually very, very important for us to reflect upon. Because while this text moves towards us understanding Christ as being divine, that's not the focus of this phrase, right? To say that he is appointed the heir of all things is to suggest to us that the Father has made a deal. Bad language, but bear with me. He's made a deal in eternity past with the Son that at some point in the future, the Son is going to inherit all that the Father possesses. Now, we know that the Father's not going to die, so there must be some other way that this inheritance can be passed from Father to Son. Now, we know, again, that for the Father to pass it to the Son, the Son has to be divine, but that word appointed indicates to us that there's some agreement that the Father and the Son have come to a, pro- a point in time, uh, 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 an action happening or something that is fulfilled where the son can now look at the father and go, it's finished. Give me my inheritance. So when God the father appointed the son as heir, this points to a reality of Christ's mediatorial office. 
fancy theological terminology for you. Which basically means that the Father and the Son agreed that upon completion of Jesus' work of redemption, he would receive the inheritance promised to him by the Father. We call this, in Reformed covenantal theology, the covenant of redemption. A pre-temporal covenant whereby the Father and the Son agree to the terms of redemption. And so I know this is vernacular, this is sort of slang, but when Jesus is hanging on the cross and says, it is finished, that, that phrase is, is monumental because what it means is this agreement that between Father and Son to redeem a people unto Himself is now completed. And so when He shows up in heaven again after His ascension, He can go to the Father and He can say, All right, Father, in eternity past we made an agreement. And I have completed perfectly everything that we had agreed upon in my active obedience in my passive obedience, I have been a perfect mediator. And now give me what you have promised. Give me my inheritance. And his inheritance is all things. Everything. Right? Everything created, everything that he has done upon the work of redemption. And so now the son is the heir of all things. He doesn't wait to inherit them. He has already inherited them. Notice the tense, right? So we can very, very inconveniently, bad word, think that Jesus is not in control of this world, that we wait for the final completion of this. No, no, this text says us that he is the heir of all things. He has been appointed such already. We don't wait. We wait for his second coming, but we don't wait for his lordship, for his kingship, for his heirship. That's already done. That's already finished. So Jesus is the heir of all things. He has received all things from the Father on account of his work to redeem a people unto himself. Second part of verse 2. And in some sense, this seems a bit backwards, but it makes sense. The second thing we learn about Jesus, the second necessary truth about him is that he is the one through whom God created the world. Now we have an explicit reference to the divinity of Jesus, because there is only one who can create, and that is God. And so when we are told here that it is through Jesus that the world is created, we are being told that Jesus is God. Now, we should have obviously figured that out already. The implication is there as the revelation of God, as the heir of the inheritance of God. But now we have that point driven home in all clarity. Now, our author is making two significant points about Jesus. Okay, so track me on this one. Hermeneutics lesson, the most important words in Scripture are always the smallest words. Always the smallest words, okay? So here is what our author is saying. Not only is the world made for Jesus, he's appointed heir of all things, but it is also made by him. So he is the agent through which the Father created the world. Now, there are three significant passages in the New Testament that help us understand that, that expand this for us. One of them is from John chapter 1, verse 3. When, it, when John says, all things came into being by him, he's a creator of the world, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Nothing was made that has been made. Okay. Then in Colossians 1.16, we're told about this even further. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. All things have been created by him and for him. 
And then we read Romans 11, 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. So you put those three verses together, that's what this short little phrase in verse 2 means. And as I said, it's a clear testimony to Jesus' deity. He is no mere human being. So this whole argument, oh, he's a carpenter, he's from Nazareth, he just this and he just that. No, no, no. He is divine. He is fully God without getting rid of his full humanity. Everything has been made, the whole universe, space, time, matter, everything has been brought into being by and through the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he can inherit it. He has been by him and through him. That's the second thing. He's the heir of all things, and he's the one who created the world. Now we get into even more of an expansion of his nature. And now we get into some really interesting terminology, very unique terminology. Beginning of verse 3, he is the radiance of God's glory. There's a, this is a seriously intense description of Jesus in verse 3. The radiance of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's nature. Both of these things, let's recognize this already, right? Both of these things are incapable of communicating the truth to which they're referring to. Right? Let's just recognize that right away. Human language is inadequate to describe the transcendental truths about God's ontological existence. Who God is in himself cannot be described by any language that we have. As Calvin reminds us a number of places, right? In his institutes, he says, you got to see scripture the way you see a father talking to a young child. Right? We, we've all either done it or we've seen it done. Right? You, and God, Calvin talks about baby talk. Right? Condescension is the more fancy word. But the way a father talks to a, a, a three-year-old to communicate to, to him or her about what's going on and, and how this should happen and how that should happen. That's how God condescends to us. And, and in his commentary on Hebrews, he says, listen, we must allow that there is a measure of impropriety in what is taken from earthly things and applied to the hidden majesty of God. So, in other words, let, let's, let's hear what the author of Hebrews is saying, but if we, if we press and push too far into it, it just breaks down. And, and, we're, and we're left with something that, that won't make any sense to us. So, it, it, we, in other words, what Calvin is saying and what, what I'm trying to communicate is that these specific phrases and words are incapable of communicating what they need to, and therefore we need to, to interpret them in light of other things that are said in the same vein, in the same kind of way elsewhere in Scripture. Last week we talked about Scripture interpreting Scripture. So we go to this passage and we go, okay, well this sounds a lot like John 1. This sounds a lot like Ephesians 1. This sounds a lot like Philippians and Colossians, right? And so we go to these places that, that talk about Jesus, and then we get this wonderfully full picture of who Jesus is from that. And so the, the first phrase here is a, is a difficult one because it talks about the radiance of God's glory. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and explain what that means with an illustration but basically what the author is saying is that the Son is one with the Father. The Son is one with the Father. So some of your translations, I always preface this by saying, trust your Bibles, read your Bibles, trust your translations. Um, but if your translation has reflection instead of radiance, Scratch out reflection and write radiance. Okay, here's why. Little illustration for you. So, the sun and the moon. Why does the moon shine at night? Because it what? Reflects the light of the sun back onto the earth. Does, is, does the moon have any light in and of itself? 
No, it doesn't, right? So without the sun's reflection, that's what happens in a total eclipse, right? Uh, In a total eclipse, right, the earth, the sun, the moon, they all line up. And if you look up at the moon, it's not there. It's gone because the earth has now blocked the sunlight. So the only way the moon can shine is by reflecting light. Why, Why does the sun shine? Because it possesses shininess, tell that to your science teacher, in and of itself. It radiates light because it is its source. So, for example, it, or based on this example, based upon this, this is my example. This is, this is one of the examples that a lot of the early church apologists use, that Jesus is reflective of the divinity of God in the same way that the sun's light reflects the sun. You can't separate the rays of sunlight from the sun. Now, modern day science, you sort of can do that, but back then you couldn't. And so you see the sun and you see the sun's light and you can't tell where the one begins. And Like, where does the sun end and the light that emanates from it begins? Right? So that's why radiance is the best word. Jesus doesn't reflect, right? Because then he would have no Radiance, no light, no divinity in himself, right? He radiates it. Why? Because he is divinity. He doesn't simply reflect God's glory. It doesn't just bounce off him, right? He radiates it. He possesses it, right? The transfiguration story, remember, we read it last week, right? One of the the, the key element to the transfiguration story is, is at the very end when the other Guys drop away and Jesus is standing there radiating the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God's presence. It's not shining down. like There's not this heavenly spotlight that's coming down. It's radiating from him. He is the divine in its fullness. Right? John 1.14. We have beheld his glory. We've beheld his divinity. Glory as, uh, as of the only Son from the Father. Jesus radiates the very nature and glory of God. To see Him is to see God. And Jesus has said that over and over again. That's one of the reasons why they tried to kill Him. You see me, you see the Father. Right before Abraham was, Yahweh, I am. That's me. Right? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. I mean, the author has just said that. God spoke through Jesus. You want to know what the Father looks like? Look at Jesus. Why? Because he is the very radiance of God's glory. He's the divine revelation of God because he is God. He's the radiance that shines forth from the source. So he's the radiance of God's glory, but he's also the exact imprint of of God's nature. So the first of these phrases convinces you that Jesus is God. He shares the same nature. Shares is a bad word. Possesses, equally whatever. He is God. Let's just say it that way. And now this phrase balances out a a a necessary distinction. This one stresses the fact that The Son is not the Father. So the the Son radiates the glory of God, so He is God. But don't ever think that the Father and the Son are the same because the Son is actually an exact imprint of the Father. Now the language here, the terminology terminology that's used, uh, refers to um, an engraving. Okay, Uh, So the back of a coin. Like our coins, right? We have the queen. That's what it's referring to. The exact imprint of God. Right? So when you look at the back, you see the queen. Okay? There's the queen. That's an exact imprint, an exact representation of who she is. Now, obviously, the illustration is poor. It's weak, right? It's, it's just dumbed down language. But what we need to understand from it is that Jesus is the perfect personal imprint of God. He radiates God because he is essentially identical. His nature is the same as God. He is divine being. 
He is the very substance of divinity, yet he's the imprint of that. He is a representation, an exact one. Now, again, these truths are stressed repeatedly by Paul elsewhere in the New Testament. Colossians 1.15, right? Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God. Same sort of idea. In Colossians 2, a little bit later on in the, chap- in the book, verses 9 and 10, Paul's going to say the same thing. For in him all the full- fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, so Paul, like the, other, like the author of Hebrews, stresses that Jesus is the very substance of God. Philippians chapter 2, right? Have this same attitude in yourselves, which is also in Jesus Christ, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. The stress is that Jesus is the very substance of God. What God is, is manifested in Jesus Christ because of his nature. He shares in the nature and substance of God. Christ's likeness to God, however, is different because he is not the Father. That's why he's an exact representation, an imprint. So when you take these two facets together, he is the radiance of God's glory and he's the exact imprint of God's nature you have a remarkable exposition of Trinitarian doctrine. Who knew that the best way to encourage people to stand firm in their faith was to complicate things by going straight to Trinitarian doctrine? But it's essential because if Jesus was just another guy, just another God, just another member of the the Greek pantheon, he's not worth taking an arrow for or being persecuted, or being thrown out of your guild. But if he is fundamentally different, if he is truly God, well, then it's, then it's worth any sacrifice you have to make. And that's what our author is saying. This is what John emphasizes. That Maybe let's help us understand what Hebrews is saying by going to an equally complicated terminology in John 1. Maybe the two of them will come together. Right? So what our author is saying in John 1.1, 1, 1, the word was God. What he's saying is that he is one with the Father in his divinity. He's one with the Father in being God. But when the exact imprint of his nature comes along, that's when we have the first half of that verse from John. The word was with God, and the Word was God. Same thing, just reversed. So what John 1 is saying is that when he says the Word was with God, he's saying he's the exact imprint of God's nature. And the Word was God, he is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus is all God, fully God, but he's not the same as the, sec- as the first member of the Trinity. So we could quote the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Jesus is very God of very God, but he is begotten, which emphasizes his sonship, not made, and yet one essence of the Father. So he's one essence of the Father, but he's begotten. So when you see Jesus, you see the Father, but when you see Jesus, you see Jesus, not the Father, but at the same time, when you see Jesus, you see the fullness of God dwelling bodily. Jesus is no less God than the Father is, and Jesus is no less God than all three together. But yet they're distinct. And this is all bound up within the mystery of the Trinity. So is Jesus worth it? Well, if this is who he is, absolutely he's worth it. So he's a radiance of God's glory, and he's the exact imprint of God's nature. Next phrase in verse 3. Jesus also upholds the universe by his powerful word. So you've already read in the second half of verse 2 that Jesus is the creator of the universe. He, He made it all. Everything in it is made by Jesus. But now we read something different about his relationship to the universe that he's created. He is the sustainer of the universe, the creator 
and the sustainer. He is not passively upholding the universe. Right? You've probably seen pictures of Atlas, right? The, the, the Greek god Atlas who is holding the earth on his shoulders, right? That's his job, well, kind of his punishment, but it's like that's his responsibility. If Atlas fails, the earth fails. And so what our author is saying, no, 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 God, he's not like Atlas. He doesn't just hold the earth up. He is actually sustaining it, directing it, moving it forward. He created it and he's continuing to be involved with it. In other words, there's, there's, there's telos there. There's purpose there. There's direction there. So when the author says he created the world, you could think that, well, that's all he did. He created the world and that's all his relationship to it. But now the author says, no, no, he sustains it. In other words, the world would cease to exist if Jesus was not sustaining the world. He organizes, he orchestrates, he orders all things so that they achieve the purposes for which they were created. Now, the word translated universe here in, in my ESV is actually a much more simplistic, it's just all. It's just a panta, all things, right? So he, he, he upholds all things by, the power, by, by his powerful world. Uh, you want to talk about big things? You want to talk about the great things, the big stuff, the, the massive stuff, right? He, he upholds that. You want to talk about the really, really, really small stuff, right? The Higgs bosons and the quarks and all the, what, however far they think they can get because of the Hadron Collider. Well, he sustains those things too, right? Everything is being upheld and carried along by the risen Christ toward its appointed goal. And what's interesting is that he does it by his word. Everything God does is on account of his speech, on, upon what he says. Now, don't ask me how that works, right? Is, is Jesus up there just constantly talking in heaven to sustain things? Probably not. But the point, the point being that God is so powerful, so strong, that all he has to do is think it. All he has to do is speak it, and it happens. The creation of the world, the sustaining of the world, is done by the mere utterance of the word of God. Now, again, think about that in the context of the religions of the time, right? All religions have God, have the gods doing something, usually fighting, and then as a result, the world is created. And usually humanity is created by either a stupid decision by somebody or an accident or it's a punishment, right? So all of that is just kind of like the gods are screwing around. They're fighting with each other. They're mad at each other. And all of a sudden, the world is created and humans are there and they're going, oh, oh what are we going to do now? Right? But what we're hearing here is that, no, no, God purposefully speaks it into existence. And he purposely sustains it and moves it towards an end. There is purpose here. Now, we don't have this whole idea of, you know, Marduk and Tiamat fighting and, and ripping somebody in half and creating the heavens and the earth. We don't have that kind of stuff anymore. But what we do have is a heresy from the 17th century that has moved its way into the church called deism. Not dualism, deism. Now, the deists argued, now the deists, to their somewhat credit, it's not going to save their souls, but they were trying to figure out how in the 1600s do we deal with this revolution in science? How do we deal with this revolution in philosophy that has pushed God completely out? And they said, well, we can bring God back in by just simply saying that he created the universe, everything within it, and then he kind of spun it like, you know, an old watch. I know we don't have those anymore, but like an old watch that you have to wind and then it runs right? That's what God did to the universe. He created everything. He created the natural order, the laws, the rules by which everything works. He wound it up, and then he just is like, all right, off you go. We're going to let the earth, we're going to let the universe, the subatomic particles, the big stuff, we're going to let that all run by its own power. He doesn't intervene. He doesn't come in to perform miracles, and he certainly doesn't providentially affect or move any affairs of humankind in general or your life in particular. He doesn't invade our world to answer prayers. 
He doesn't invade our world to move things around because he has some sort of purpose and we keep screwing it up. So he's got to come in and just kind of bump things back. He, he never does that. He just winds it up and, and lets it go. He's distant, he's remote, and he's altogether uninvolved in the affairs of mankind. Now, you, you think about that and you go, well, I, I don't believe any of that. But yet, how many times have I not heard Christians say things like this? What does God care if I? That's small d deism. That's to say that God is saying to you, you're right, I don't care. I care about the big stuff, but not the little stuff. That's deism with a small d. That's basically saying, you know what? God is just going to let you do whatever you want. He doesn't care about this and this and this. He only cares about blank. Right? I've heard Christians say things like, why does God care what happens in the bedroom? Excuse me? Right? That is blasphemous, but it's an extension of this sort of deistic mindset that God, God's just creating the world and, and he's just kind of out there watching. And, and most Christians have this absolutely pathetic view of providence that God will only get involved when he needs to. It's like he's made a plan to go this way and when we screw it up big time, then he'll just come back in and he'll just go boop. And then now we're spinning back over here, right? Like the palm Pong from the old Atari games. Right? He slides his thing, dink, dink, right? That's all he's doing. He's playing cosmic version of Pong. Except we have free will and we can do a lot more, whatever. Illustrations suck. Anyway. But that's not what Scripture teaches. That's not where this text is going. This text is going where Romans 11.36 goes. This is a pretty significant verse for your understanding of God's providence. For from him and through him, and here's the one, to him are all things. So not just from and through, not just creating and setting, it, but this is going to him, to his purposes. Christ calls all things into existence out of nothing. And in preservation, he sustains all things. Colossians 1 verse 17 right, says very similar things. In him, all things hold together. In his relationship to creation, he takes all that he has created and is currently directing it towards the purpose and conclusion which he has determined. And it's this last emphasis that does not allow us as Christians to have anything but a view of God's providence that is meticulous. He is directing everything from him and through him and to him are what? All things. Same word. All things. Does God care if I? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. So what we see here is utterly contrary to any kind of modern scientific or rational thought. Now, you know, I am very intrigued by the relationship of faith and science. It's one of my passions. I love it, so I don't want to get into it too much. But what we do know about the world around us that is non-Christian is that it's, it's naturalism, right? Materialism. All that exists is physical stuff, right? In, in, in final reality, the universe is simply matter in motion, right? One, one of the most famous statements about the world is that uh, about, okay, not creation, but about biology, about evolution, is that evolution is a process that did not have us in mind. In other words, don't think for a second that evolution is going somewhere. No, 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 it's just happening. It may have ended with you. It may have ended with something else. It didn't have anything in mind. And this text and many others say, no. No, absolutely not. The ultimate and foundational reality of everything that exists is the powerful, creative, sustaining, purposeful, teleological, providential word of God. And if you think anything other than that, you can't do science and you can't do faith. The only reason there even is a physical reality 
is because Christ made it and he sustains it every moment. And then, end of verse 3, our author changes, right? These massive truths, these, these massive comments about Jesus' power and his revelation and his, his deity focus. They, they just get honed into his work as a priestly sacrifice. The last phrase of verse 3 is this. He made purification for sins. Jesus made purification for our sins. The author is emphasizing the priestly supremacy of Christ. And now we start to see some of the real true purposes for which Christ sustains things. You just, just sort of think about it this way. We've been all over the created universe with Jesus. He created everything. He sustains everything. And now we find ourselves narrowing to one particular activity of Jesus. He's introduced to us as the supreme and perfect priest who paid for our sins with his own blood. It sure narrows the focus and the purpose for which this world is created, right? So let's note some things briefly. First, let's notice this. He. The personal pronoun. He. Now why is that important? Because the forgiveness that we are offered, the forgiveness that we experience when is, is the result of a person doing something. Forgiveness is not offered to us because of some moral law built into creation. That if we follow a sort of checklist of doing the right things more than the wrong things, that God will forgive us. Right? This isn't about weighing the balance, right? I'm a good person. In other words, my good outweighs the bad. So when I get to heaven, God will see that and he'll say, forgiven all your bad stuff wiped away by all your good stuff. That's not how it worked. Because he made purification for sins. Yeah, forgiveness doesn't happen by God simply waving his hand. Right? Uh, this, this is complicated theological stuff which we don't have time to get in. But God cannot just simply forgive without payment. Later on, the author, if he was going to tell us why, there is no forgiving of sins without shedding of blood. Now, that's a covenantal statement that we'll get into later. But now we realize that it takes a he doing something, shedding his blood, in order for forgiveness to be granted. And it surely doesn't come from us putting our faith in a godlike sense that we might have. Right? That, that, hey, you know what? If you've never met Jesus, but you're a good person, you have this sort of spiritual sense that something out there is, is bigger than you and, 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 and more important than you, and you follow that, oh, God will honor that. That's good enough. No. Purification takes a he to accomplish. And it took Jesus, who is that he, in his passive and active obedience to make purification for his sins. Just for the record, it now dawned on me. If you don't quite understand the difference... Well, as theologians, we talk about the passive and active obedience. The active obedience of Christ is a sinless, perfect life. His passive obedience is his obedience within the final hours of his death, where he gave up himself to be punished, killed, etc., etc. And both are necessary. That's a different sermon for a different day. So it takes a he, and that he is Jesus. Note the past tense as well, made. He made. He's not making purification now. It's not, it's not as though each time you mess up, each time you commit a sin, Jesus has to do something more, you know, kind of add another layer for your ongoing rebellion, right? So this is why we're Protestants and not Catholics, right? The Mass, right? What, what happens in, the, in, in Catholicism is when the priest prays upon the elements, they become the body and the blood, which means that every time that a Catholic priest, or this is what he thinks, he thinks that every time that he prays on the elements, it becomes the body and the blood of Christ, which means he has not made 
purification. Every time the Mass is performed, he makes purification again. And Luther's going to go after this hard and say, no, no, Jesus is not continually sacrificed. That's what the Mass is saying. No, 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 he made purification. It's over. He's done. Right? Nor does it say that he will make purification as though we are left hanging and wondering if our sins will be purified. Right? As though we, we sin and wonder, oh, oh, was that the one that knocked me off? Right? Because most of us have this, this perspective of salvation, right? We, I've talked about this, where, where the gospel, where Jesus gets us through the door, and then it's almost like we get through the door, Jesus kicks us in, boom, Holy Spirit's there, he's going to help you, hope to see you on the other side. And the rest is up to us. Right? We have to use the Spirit and the grace, and then hopefully we get to the other side and Jesus is there going, ha ha, you made it. No, that's not what happens. He made purification for our sins. The purification that he made for us is completed and can never be undone. This speaks about the finished, final, once for all, accomplished atonement. The words of Jesus on the cross, it's finished. It's not, dang it, man, I hope this works. You know, if we were an Arminian, that's what he would say, right? He's hanging on the cross going, hope it worked. Hope somebody's going to believe, right? Or he didn't say it is kind of 55%-ish, right? Or, 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 or maybe one of these progress, you know, when you install software, right? You get this bar across, right? And then above Jesus, he says, it is finished. And then you get like a 65% bar. No, it's finished. Why? Because he made purification, right? Why was purification needed? Look at the next term, sin. That's why purification is needed. The single greatest threat to our souls now and for eternity is our sin. Our unbelief, our idolatrous trust in things other than God, our self-indulgent efforts to make life work without Him, our prideful arrogance in thinking that we can do it on our own, uh, our prideful thinking that we don't need anyone's help to get right with God. Our sin has defi defiled us. It defiles our souls. It defiles our hearts. It renders us morally filthy, morally unclean. And in the sight of an infinitely beautiful and holy and righteous God, that sin is the most disgusting of stains. And the one thing we need more than anything else is purification. And that's what Jesus has done fully and finally. By his blood on the cross, in the place of sinners, he has rendered them pure and clean. Watch them White as snow. Right? Think about the, the twin illustrations that is, are used by Isaiah. Filthy rags is the best you can offer. Filthy menstrual rags, if I can quote Isaiah's actual words. And what God does in Jesus Christ is he washes that white as snow. And put things together and what we find is that Everything required by an infinitely holy God to overcome and remove the barrier of your sin is done by Jesus Christ. Completed. It's over. All that remains for you to do is to repent and to believe in it and to lay hold of it. And this, by the way, is the gospel. Right? If you ever, if you ever wonder what the gospel is... Uh, the, this is the gospel right here, right? What's the gospel? He made purifications for my sin. That's it. It's not complicated, but it's so massively important. And then we're told the seventh thing is that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Turn just in, a little bit forward in Hebrews chapter 10. I just want to read a couple of verses here because it helps us to set the context here, to help us see the contrast of what's going on. Notice, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll read verses 1 to 4, and then we'll drop down and read verse 11 to 14. For since the law has but a shadow 
of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year may perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Go down to verse 11. We'll just read verse 11. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away the sins. Now notice the contrast between what Hebrews 10 says, which we should know already from our Old Testament, and what is being said here in verse 3. Jesus is king over all things. He's king over all people. He reigns in power. He reigns in royal supremacy. Yes, that's all included in this particular statement. But what the point of it really is, is that made means completed. He sat down. He sat down. After making purification for sins by living a perfect life and dying death, there's nothing else to do to purify So he sits down at the right hand of God. He sits down at a place of honor and privilege and favor and power. And in sitting down, we see the finality of the atoning sacrifice. The priests of the Old Covenant, as as chapter 10 says, they had to remain standing in their work. Right? The the thing I was thinking about this week is is whenever the, the, the high priest would go in from from the outside into the Holy of Holies to do his work. Right? You remember that he had, to, he had to wear bells on his robe. And the reason why is because that told the people on the outside that he wasn't dead. So as he moves around, ding, 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 ding. All right, God hasn't killed him yet. Ding, 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 ding. And then he leaves. Right? And then he's got to go back in again. You imagine the relief of that priest? Whew. Made it one more year. But there's no, no sense next, no, no guarantees next year. That I might not enter unpure, or uh, that I might not enter in the right way, and it'll be ding, ding, boom. And that's what the author is saying. No more of that. No more need for that. No more need for bells on the robe. No need to keep going back to the sacrifices. This is finished. He's offered a single sacrifice in the giving of himself on the cross. And by doing so, Jesus has fully and finally and forever made purification for his sins. And so he sits. So what makes Jesus so special? The title of this sermon is Seven Necessary Truths. Why are they necessary? Well, not just because they are beautiful theology, but entirely because they are beautiful theology. See, this is the kind of thinking about Jesus that forms the foundation of your faith, the foundation of your life. If Jesus is anything less than this, then what is the point? What's the point? Right? As, as, as is said elsewhere in the New Testament, we are the biggest of fools. Right? If Paul says if Jesus isn't resurrected, we're idiots. We should be living it up. We should be doing whatever we want, just hedonism to the nth degree. But if this is who Jesus is, it changes everything, right? If God exists and has spoken through His Son and has done what He has said He has done in these verses through His Son, it changes everything. Let me just explain to you how these seven necessary truths change everything about the way you look at life. There's like, I don't know, 10 of them. I'm just going to read them out. These are 10, 12, I don't know. I mean, I can't count them. I I tried to number them this morning, but it screwed up my whole outline, so I left it. But here's how these seven necessary truths change your life. It means, first of all, first one, it means that you never need to fear ever again that your sins are going to bring you to eternal judgment. He has made purification. Second thing, it means that you never need again live in fear of death. Death sucks. 
for the people left behind, but for those who die in faith in Jesus Christ, it means eternal fellowship. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we're living for? Intimacy with the Heavenly Father and His Son. The beatific vision. It means that you never need to worry when the world seems out of control. You know, our, our world has gone through a lot of garbage lately, right? And it always boggled my mind how Christians lost their freaking minds when government started shutting things down. Oh, we have rights. We have this. Listen, don't you think for a second that God is not in control no matter what happens in this world. So just calm down. Because when the world seems out of control, what you need to remember is that Jesus is upholding the universe by the word of his power. From him, through him, and to him are all of these things going. Calm down. There's nothing that can challenge his power. There's nothing that can rattle his hold on the universe. So when things go bad in big or small things, he is upholding the universe by the word of his power. Fourth, it means that you never need to search for an identity. It, it, it means you never have to wonder who you are. Why? Because of this. Paul says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And then he says this using language. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. That's who you are. You are a child of God, a fellow heir of all things with Jesus Christ. It means that you never have to worry about anything or anyone separating you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. He has made purification for your sins. And he says confidently in John, no one will ever snatch them from my hand. I've made purification for them. I've shed my blood for them. They are part of my inheritance that the Father has given me from eternity past. You think the Father is going to go back on his word and allow one to escape my grasp? Not a chance. It means that you never need to ever be crippled by guilt and shame for all the ways in which you have failed God or sinned against God, or done something that has stained the name of God. There is no guilt. There is no shame. Why? Paul says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Who is to condemn? And then he answered, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is a right hand of God interceding for us. There is no one who can condemn. There is no one who can bring a charge. Your shame, your guilt has all been purified by the work of Jesus Christ. It means that you never need again strive and strain and work and labor to win God's favor and approval. It has already been won by Jesus Christ. In fact, I would say it is utter blasphemy to think that you can pay for your own sins or work for the favor of the Father by your own righteousness, which is no righteousness at all. It means that you never need again live in anxiety and in fear about whether you've done enough to make your own atonement for the shortcomings that you have and the sins that you've committed because there is only one way to salvation and it is through the purification of sins that Christ has won. Romans chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law 
although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. When you come to faith in Jesus, you get all of the righteousness that Christ has won when he made purifications for your sins. So don't worry about trying to make God happy. He already is. It means that you never need again wonder whether when you stand in God's presence on the day of judgment, whether or not you will be properly prepared to face God. You never have to worry whether you're going to find acceptance before the Father because for the Father to reject you is for Him to reject His Son, which He will never do. It means that you never have to worry if there is enough mercy and grace and help in the hour of testing or temptation. Hebrews 7 later on is going to tell us that He is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Don't think for a second that just because the son is sitting at the father's right hand that he's not doing anything. He is sitting there to make intercession for you, to answer your prayers, to overcome your shortcomings, to give you grace upon grace upon grace when this world seems too much. It means that you never again need to live in conformity with someone's expectations of you. It means you never have to, to, to follow the rules that this world has for you. It, it means that you don't have to follow the rules of legalism and religion. It just means that you're accepted and that's it. There are no rules to follow. There are relationship guidelines that the covenant sets for you, but, but you don't have to worry about conforming to such and such and so and so in order to be accepted by God. Last one. It means that you can now and forever breathe a deep sigh of relief and be filled with inexpressible joy and have an immeasurable hope knowing that a perfect sacrifice for your sins has been offered and that all of your condemning guilt, yesterday, today, and forever, has been wiped completely clean and that by faith in Jesus alone, you stand clothed in his righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the author of Hebrews who was just so beautifully inspired to write such intensely theological and intensely practical words for our encouragement. And Lord, I pray that as we go through the the machinations of our life as we live and move in a world that has fallen, in a world that is rebellious against you, and in a world that treats us the way it treated you. I pray that we would find encouragement in these truths. That we would know that because you are the creator and sustainer of this world, that because you, as, as the perfect sacrifice, have given us everything that we need for life and godliness that the foundation upon which we stand would be increasingly firm. And Lord, that because we live in and on these truths, Lord, find us faithful. Give us strength and power and courage in witness. Give us strength and power and courage as we face the temptations around us. And Lord, give us the hope and the joy that comes with knowing what we know. Amen.